The US-led Defence Contact Group, a collection of allies supporting Ukraine, has reaffirmed its commitment to supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. Army General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that Ukraine was making steady progress but would be, it would be a violent fight and come at a high cost. United States Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin also met with the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, who reaffirmed plans for the bloc to strengthen its own defences. When we meet the NATO-Ukraine uh, uh, Commission um, shortly, the main message will be that we need to uh, sustain and step up our support uh, for uh, Ukraine. Uh, at our meeting uh, and our uh, discussions here today and tomorrow, we will also prepare for the upcoming Vilnius summit, uh, where uh, the message will be about support Ukraine, but also the need to strengthen uh, our own uh, deterrence and defence. Now for more on this, let's cross over to correspondent Terry Schultz, who's been following the story from NATO headquarters in Brussels. Terry, good to see you. What did we hear from Defence Secretary Austin and General Mark Milley after that meeting of the Ukraine Defence Contact Group? Well, these U.S. officials who started this contact group, of course, very much want to rally all the NATO allies and more. Remember, there are 50 countries here, not just the 31 NATO allies. They want to rally everyone around the world to support Ukraine, again, this phrase, for as long as it takes. And it's taking a lot longer than people would have liked. Ukraine seems to be holding its own, even making some progress in Bakhmut and in other areas. But this war is going to go on a very, very long time. And during this process, of course, Ukraine is suffering horribly. Uh, Russia's air assault gets worse every day, both on civilians, on civilian infrastructure, and on the supplies that allies are sending for Ukraine to defend itself. So today we heard a lot about air defense. We also heard a lot about interoperability. All these weapons that the allies are sending need to work together. They need to be able to resupply each other for these systems. So uh, this was the 13th meeting of this group, and it, it doesn't seem like there's there's any end in sight, but they, were, they seem to be quite encouraged by by, by the offers of contributions that allies brought to the table today. The possible length of the war, the difficulty of the war was mentioned many times. I want to talk more with you about that. But first, let's hear, Terry, to what General Mark Milley had to say. It would be very premature to put any uh, estimates of how long time uh, on an operation of this magnitude. Uh, there are several hundred thousand Russian troops dug in and prepared positions uh, all along the front line. Uh, and uh, Ukraine has uh, uh, begun their attack, and they are making st uh, steady progress. This is a very difficult fight. Uh, it is a very violent fight, uh, and it will likely take a considerable amount of time and at high cost. Terry, uh, in that context, what did you make of Lloyd Austin announcing that many countries had signed multi-year commitments here? and Ukraine as well, because, of course, the U.S. being the biggest contributor to NATO and to Ukraine, the U.S. is willing to and able to continue funding this fight in Ukraine longer than some of the smaller countries. But they did mention specifically these multi-year contracts because that's what they want countries to do, to commit to fighting with Ukraine, uh, as again, as long as it takes. They keep saying it. I have to keep saying it, too. Uh, because without this money, without this reassurance that it won't dry up in a year or two, Ukraine really does doesn't have any way to go, to go on. It needs to continue being resupplied with ammunition, with missiles, with equipment. It hopes with ever more uh, sophisticated equipment, like it hopes aircraft. And so they, they need to be to be to be keeping in mind this long term perspective. What will we provide now? What will we provide next? How can we keep the equipment that we've sent uh, repaired and also uh, full of ammunition? That's another big question we've talked about before. They're running out of ammunition, and at this very moment, uh, Allies are talking with defence companies about how to ramp up the production lines for that. Terry, it's only day one of these meetings. As it's happening, the European Parliament is urging NATO to offer men membership to Ukraine at the NATO summit. How realistic is that, given what we've heard so far? 
it's not very realistic that Ukraine is going to be offered full membership. I should point out uh, that the European Union hasn't done so either. So the European Parliament on the other side of town could, could also work on that for Ukraine. But here at NATO headquarters, uh, you heard Secretary Austin asked whether the U.S. would be in support of, of quick membership for Ukraine. And he basically obfuscated because the U.S. and Germany are among those countries most reluctant to come up with a timeline for Ukraine. So what the European Parliament resolution said was that once the war is over, Ukraine should be admitted to NATO as quickly as possible. Now, it seems like that could be a, a statement on which you get agreement because as quickly as possible for some countries might mean months. For other countries, it will likely mean many years. Terry Schultz in Brussels, thank you so much. We are at NATO headquarters, joined by Estonia's Defense Minister Hanno Pevkor. Thank you so much for being with us, Minister. Uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is in early days, but do you expect it to be a turning point of the war? I really do hope that. Uh, although we have seen also the counteroffensive already uh, uh, many months back. So when we take the Kharkiv uh, and, and also Kherson, uh, then we saw that Ukrainians were quite successful. So of course now it will be more difficult as uh, uh, Russians have built uh, many uh, defense lines and we all understand how difficult it is for Ukraine. But we were talking a lot about these options, what Ukrainians have. And my message has always been that, you know, please do not put uh, a lot of pressure to Ukrainians because they know exactly what to do and they will do anything in their power and everything in their power to, to get back their territories. The big question here is how to ramp up military assistance for Ukraine and what they need right now. Uh, what's on their list? We know fighter jets, uh, long range missiles, but maybe is ammunition the most pressing issue? What would you say? I would say that uh, the, when we take the priorities and then first and foremost air defense because uh, they need to protect their own uh, land forces in order to be able to move. Uh, secondly, to uh, keep uh, the Russian Air Force out of the counteroffensive. Uh, then the second uh, priority definitely is ammunition, 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 because uh, the uh, use of ammunition is uh, very, very uh, big. Uh, sec uh, and thirdly, uh, everything uh, regarding the, all the other equipment, when we talk about spare parts already, when we talk about the maintenance, when we talk about replacing uh, uh, lost uh, uh, equipment, etc. So, so this and of course training for the new troops. So these are the like necessary things Ukraine needs at the moment and constantly need. But what is very important today uh, here in, in Brussels is that all the allies, when we take the Rammstein format where we have more than 50 countries, everyone said clearly, we will not go away. So we will be together with Ukraine as long as it takes. And uh, there is no chance for Putin, for Kremlin to think that the uh, West will uh, uh, go away uh, from Ukraine's back. No, we will not go.